It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ray Hart, the Executive Director of the Council of Great City Schools. Ray has extensive experience working in large urban school districts and supporting instructional practice that help improve student achievement. Dr. Hart and his organization are great supporters of NCS and the NAEP program. NCS is able to report on select large urban school districts because of the support and commitment of the Council of Great City Schools and its members. During this plenary session, Ray will dig deeply into data on student learning. Then he'll facilitate a conversation with leaders from four of our large urban school districts. After that panel, Leslie Muldoon will return and lead a panel of governing board members to discuss policies that can lead to improvement. It is an honor and pleasure to be a part of the Institute of Educational Sciences Mathematics Summit. As Gina shared, I am Ray Hart. I'm the executive director with the Council of Great City Schools, and we represent 78 of the nation's largest urban school districts of the, across the country. 27 of our large urban school districts participate in the Trial Urban District Assessment Program, uh, also known as TUDA, where they receive district-specific scores on NAEP that allow them to gauge their progress, their growth, and also address any challenges that they might be facing in their respective districts. Our member districts have never shied away from looking at not only our progress, but also our challenges in terms of how we improve student outcomes for students across the country. Given that, we have taken a specific deep dive in a, the data and used and implemented a number of things to help improve our student outcomes. I wanna thank the speakers from the previous panels, uh, and in particular, I wanna thank Dr. Peggy Carr for sharing and presenting the nation's performance as it relates to mathematics. At the council, one of the things that we like to do once those scores are released is take a deep dive into the data to understand what it means, what it means for our students, and what it means in terms of addressing the instructional needs across our member districts. Quite often, when we look at declines in scores, they're viewed as learning loss. However, when we take a deeper dive and go beyond the test scores, what we quite often see is that the scores actually reflect unfinished learning rather than just simply learning loss. As an example, uh, some of the items might reflect that they had a part A, a part B, and a part C. Well, students may have gotten part A right and part B right, but they didn't go as far as getting part C right. So the score is reflected as a completely or a missed score. But in reality, when you look deeper, students had some semblance of understanding, perhaps, but perhaps not the full contextual understanding that they needed to get the answer correct. So what we'd like to do is take a few moments right now and look beyond the test scores for a few moments. And then we'll take a moment to talk to some of our urban districts who have continue to improve after the NAEP results came out on their state exams and talk to them about some of the things they've done to improve. So at this time, I'd like to introduce the council's research director, Dr. Akisha Osei Sarfo, who is going to share some information with you about what it means to go beyond the test scores. And Akisha will introduce several other of our staff at the council. And I wanna thank all of them for participating in their support, Akisha. Thank you, Ray. Um, as Ray stated, a lot of the research work at the Council of the Great City Schools utilizes assessment data as measures to understand the report on student progress across our urban school districts. We have an established relationship with the National Assessment Governing Board, um, in addition to that, to lead the TUDA task force where we gather feedback on the administration and use of NAEP data across a small group of district leaders from our 27 TUDA districts. And in those conversations, we often hear the need to dig deeper into NAEP scores for a better understanding of students' skills and assets, as well as instructional and learning gaps. So you've heard a lot today um, about NAEP 2022 assessment results and scores. Um, in this session, we dive deeper and look beyond the test scores at three different math items, NAEP math items. 
these three items analyzed in this presentation are selected from the NAEP question tool, which can be accessed online. The tool includes a portion of the questions from each NAEP tested subject area, grade level, and testing year. Through the tool, users can view test questions, performance data, and sample responses, and can even create custom assessments and rosters. For this session, we analyzed the three math items from the 2022 NAEP math assessment and examined response choices and patterns by jurisdiction, by jurisdiction and across student groups. At the Council of the Great City Schools, we worked to understand and improve student performance in the nation's largest urban school districts. Therefore, this presentation focuses on student performance and responses within the large city jurisdiction. The three math items examined in this presentation are included in your handouts if you'd like to follow along and test your own ability to answer NAEP math items. I'll now pass it on to my colleague, Brian Garcia, research manager for the council, who will review results from this analysis of responses to math items. Denise Walston, the council's chief of curriculum, will follow up the analytic results for each math item with an explanation as to how students interpret and respond differently to each question, their assets and skills and answer choices, and the instructional gaps that likely exist influencing differences in student outcomes. We should note that inferences from this analysis are made without access to the 2022 restricted use NAEP data, which, allow us, which would allow us to look even deeper at actual student responses and additional information. Brian? Thank you so much, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it is my pleasure to sort of go over these questions briefly, go over some of the data that we see, and then pass it to my wonderful colleague, Denise, for additional context. So for those of you that haven't had an opportunity to look at the questions yet, we are starting off with item number one. It is a geometry fourth grade question, and it is set at a hard level difficulty. Uh, in brief, students are tasked with plotting a course from uh, Paul's house to school, and they have to select the correct answers. Uh, for those of you interested, the correct answers are A and D. Starting with a look at the national level, we have a comparison between national public school students and large city school students. Uh, as we see here, there's a three percentage point gap between large city and national public students who answered correctly. There's also a difference in the uh, omission rate. Looking further into the large city responses by race, we see a higher percentage of white, Asian Pacific Islander, and students who identify as two or more races answered correctly more than their black and Latino peers. We also see again that variation in omission rate. Looking at economically disadvantaged versus not economically disadvantaged, we see a 13 percentage point difference between the two groups, as well as a slight variation in responses uh, by male and female, though they're pretty close to one another. I will now pass it to Denise to add some uh, wonderful context to this. So one of the things as you look at this particular item, um, the ver very first answer was correct. And in some cases, uh, one of the things that we're making inferences based on um, uh our teaching experiences as well as talking to students and looking at student responses so just to share you share with you some of that information our goal is to look at the glass as being half full instead of half empty so in some cases the very first answer choice was correct and that may have drawn students to feel that I'm finished, I've answered the problem correctly, and I can now move on. Instead of looking at all possible answer choices, which of course D was the other answer choice. The other thing that we found when we looked at this item is question C. The students uh, that chose that particular answer choice looked at going seven blocks north and three blocks east. So were the students making, have a, did they have an idea that they were going from their school to the house rather than from Paula's house to the school? So in each case, we want to look at what conceptions do students have and how can we leverage 
their conceptions and anything that's actually missing to move their learning forward. And so not answering the question completely, just choosing one answer choice, but then uh, making the inference that they wanted to answer the question going from the school to the house instead of what the question stem asked them to respond to. So Brian, that's just a quick take on um, that particular item. And then Brian is gonna look at question number eight, an eighth grade item that has a lot of connections to the fourth grade item here. So Brian. Thank you, yes. Moving to the eighth grade now, we have an algebra uh, question, which is marked level easy. Uh, similarly, it, it uses a graph for students. And in this question, they are prompted to select the next two points on the graph to complete the sequence based off of the already plotted three points. Um, again, for those of you interested in the correct answer, the first would be three, five, and the next one would be four, seven. Again, starting at the national level, there was a seven percentage point difference between large city and national public students answering correctly. Looking into the large city responses by race, we have white and Asian Pacific Islander students answering correctly more than black and Hispanic students, as well as students who identify as two or more races. Uh, again, we have also some variation in the omission rate between the different racial groups. Finally, looking at the responses by economic status as well as gender, we see a difference between economically disadvantaged and not economically disadvantaged, as well as a little bit more of a variation between the uh, percent correct for male versus female, female students uh, answering 69% correctly versus 64% for the male. And I will hand it back to Denise to uh, lend us some more context. So you can see the connections between the fourth grade item and this eighth grade item. So in many instances, one of the things that uh, students didn't, d would not do for this one was they may have given only the ordered pair three, five, instead of providing both ordered pairs, very similar to uh, the fourth grade item. But what happened if the students, sometimes they will interchange the, the, uh, ordered, the ordered pairs themselves, they will write instead of three, five, five, three, or seven, four. That's a quick fix for so many of us. Um, and then in so many instances, we may think that what students are inferring from a graph is correct, but we've got to be very intentional about making connections between the ordered pair, the graph, a table, or the graph of a straight line. So if you're using a graphing calculator of Desmos, make sure that students are talking and talking about what they're seeing and what they're actually writing so that you could catch that particular mistake. Um, the other thing that we notice in some instances is that instead of as answering, they may have answered three, five, but they may have given the ordered pair four, six. That has something to do with being field independent versus dependent. And in some instances, they will infer that the, the Y value of the ordered pair is automatically two units more than the previous Y value in the ordered pair. So hence coming up with four, six. But we will hear that if we allow students to talk about what they're seeing and what they're doing. Um, Brian, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much. And rounding us out for item number three, we have a bit of a different question here. With our previous two questions, students could either get all credit or no credit. This one allows for a variation in scoring. And so what students are asked to do is first, uh, given the four random numbers, uh, to complete an equation that would produce the highest uh, value possible. After that, they have to write a rule that would allow them to always get the highest value possible with any randomly generated four numbers. Starting again at the national level, we see here students can either get satisfactory, which would give them full credit, partial, minimal, or incorrect, which would be no credit, or omitted. Comparing large city and national public schools, 
uh, we're going to look at the incorrect percentages here. 65% of large city students answered incorrectly compared to 60% of national public. We also continue to see a higher percentage of large city students omitting to answer the question. When we look at large city responses by race, white and Asian Pacific Islander students have the lowest percentage answering incorrectly at 41 and 43% respectively. Interestingly though, white students also had the highest percentage that chose to omit the question at 5% compared to all the other racial groups. And then again, looking at economically disadvantaged, we see a 16 percentage point difference between economically disadvantaged and not economically disadvantaged students getting a satisfactory, which would be the full credit rating on their scores. Uh, you can also see the breakout in answering incorrectly as well as partial and satisfactory between those groups. Uh, for male versus female, we see a very sort of similar pattern. However, again, there is the slight difference between male and female with more males answering incorrectly than females. And I'll hand it back over to Denise. So with this extended response question, one of the things that we found is most students answered part A correctly. However, their explanation uh, may have varied. Some students wrote bigger times bigger subtract smaller, which they received full credit for. Others, uh, if you even think about uh, some of the things that students typically will do, they may have just answered that they would have given the first part of the question correctly, but in their explanation, it may not have been as clear. They may have written bigger times bigger and not even allude to the fact that they were subtracting a smaller. There were some instances where students just wrote uh, subtract the smaller. However, when you look at their original response to part a they were completely correct they knew exactly what to do but they didn't receive full credit because their explanation was not clear so listening to our students hearing them and seeing them will be a big help in terms of curtailing some of this unfinished learning that we sometimes see. Um, there are so many practices that address this. Um, I'm just gonna quickly uh, go through this. Our goal was to really give you an idea of how do we mitigate the opportunity to learn gap um, and really focus on elevating student knowledge and really revealing students' funds of knowledge so that we can um, address their needs and really move their thinking and learning forward. So we identified just some bullets that, uh, and I'm just gonna highlight just one particular bullet. It's the whole idea about the difference between conceptual and procedural understanding. Those are not two separate be beings. We need to make explicit connections, help students make explicit connections between them. But the other piece that the connections um, are so important is between the spoken word, the written word, the pictorial representations, and the concrete representations. They do not um, exist in isolation to a, um, a uh, create greater opportunities for all of our students, making connections between and among all of those things would be a big help. And also looking at questions that may have more than one plausible answer, tasks that are rich, tasks that in some cases would not have a question stem, but allowing students to decide what it is that they would want to actually investigate would be really, really helpful. Um, I'm reminded of how Dr. Harris started us out with, I am an infinite being with infinite possibilities. And so one of the things our team is trying to do is to look beyond the data to really allow us to see the brilliance of all of our students so that their confidence in mathematics increases as well. Akisha, I'm going to turn it back to you. 
Great. Well, you, you pretty much summed it up for us. Thank you both, Denise and Brian. Okay. Uh, the presentation not only highlighted students' assets and understanding and responding to the various math questions, but also highlighted a number of different factors that influence differences in students' responses and performance on the NAEP math assessment, most of which are tied to instructional gaps and learning expectations. We encourage you as math instructional leaders and enthusiasts to also look beyond the test scores, look beyond the numbers, and really examine differences in how students actually respond to assessment items. We push you to gain a deeper understanding of their depth of knowledge, as well as their opportunities to learn and the role you play instructionally in guiding students' math knowledge and ability and confidence in completing math tasks. Now I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Hardwell, who will introduce uh, leaders from several of our urban school districts who are leading the work in math improvement and addressing some of the opportunities to learn highlighted in today's presentation. Thank you very much to the council team, and we appreciate your sharing that 